I'm going to be talking today about some of the defining questions in immunology. And I'm going to take you back to the 19th century. So the Franco-Prussian War ended in 1872 with the siege of Paris. And this rivalry between the French and the Germans carried on into the field of science for the next few decades. Two of the most important investigators of the time were Robert Koch in Berlin and Louis Pasteur in Paris. And their laboratories had helped establish the germ theory of disease, showing us for the first time that disease was actually caused by pathogens, by microbes, and not by some unknown imbalance of bodily humors. The pace of discovery was truly remarkable. To just cite one example, in 1884, Loeffler in Berlin described the bacillus that causes diphtheria. In 1887, Rue and Yersin in Paris showed that this bacteria secreted a toxin into culture supernatants, and this was a lethal toxin. In 1890, Brieger and Franco in Cox Laboratory in Berlin showed that they could inject this toxin into small animals and show the, some form of immunity. Later that same year, also in Cox Laboratory, Shibasaburo Kitasato and Emil Bering chemically inactivated the diphtheria toxin, injected it into large animals in increasing doses, and showed the presence of a principle in the serum of these animals, which they called an antitoxin, which could neutralize the diphtheria toxin. Within a year of this, of this discovery, children who were dying, gasping for breath from diphtheria, were being miraculously saved by the injection of this antitoxin. Serum therapy caught on all across the world. This was a remarkable new form of therapy, which was the first scientific approach to actually treating a disease. A young man called Paul Ehrlich returned to the laboratory from Egypt, came back to Cox Laboratory. He saw all this excitement about serum therapy and antitoxins. And he realized, while his colleagues had made a remarkable discovery, a life-saving discovery, what they had missed was an underlying principle. And the underlying principle was that when a foreign substance is injected into a vertebrate, it creates complementary molecules. Ehrlich would name these molecules that were injected into animals as antigens, and the complementary molecules were, which were then produced by the recipient animal, he called antibodies or anticorpos. Ehrlich was a remarkable scientist. He would make many discoveries in his lifetime. As a medical student, he described the existence of mast cells. He had devised stains, and he looked and found a new cell type, which he then described, which is an important cell in immunity. He would go on to describe antigens and antibodies. He would also describe a phenomenon that he called horror autotoxicus, or autoimmunity. He predicted that there might be immune phenomena where we attacked ourselves. He's the first person to think about the immune surveillance of cancer. He was also the first person to start the field of chemotherapy. The entire field of cancer chemotherapy and antibiotic therapy owes a debt to Ehrlich, who came up with the first chemotherapeutic. But his most remarkable contribution was to think about a model for how the immune system worked. And this he called the side chain hypothesis. And in a sense, you have to think about a time 60 years before the fluid mosaic model of the membrane is known, more than 65 years before we have the first polypeptide hormone receptor described. And Ehrlich comes out with a model where he imagines an immune cell has antibodies on the surface as receptors. And then he visualizes antigens coming, triggering the immune cell, so triggering a receptor, and then the cell induces more of the same antibody. So this remarkable hypothesis, which is uh, described in this slide, is to suggest, as Ehrlich did, that we already have all these different antibodies on the cell surface, and that an antigen comes by, interacts with one of these ant ant antibodies, and triggers the release of the same antibody into the blood. Now, 
at this time, when he came out with this model, Ehrlich had also done experiments to show that he could modify a chemical at a single atom, and you could create a new antibody. Karl Landsteiner, who was one of Ehrlich's greatest opponents intellectually, had done similar experiments. He had taken chemicals, also modified them uh, at a single atom, and he had made new antibodies. So there were antibodies which are highly specific and could recognize a single atom difference between two molecules. It was clear that there was an immense number of antibodies. The number of antibodies within us was probably infinite. How could you possibly conceive of the fact that we already have all these antibodies within us? That was what Ehrlich was suggesting. So to reframe this, the clear picture that emerged at that time was, how can we create complementary structures? Are these pre-existing or have they to be induced? To give you an analogy, imagine you have 100 people showing up for a job at UCSF or they're going to start at UCSF today or maybe at Google or wherever you want. Each one of these people goes to an office and gets an ID card made. And the ID card requires that he has a photograph taken and then it gets laminated and then you have an ID. Now, this is a model where you show up, you get your photograph taken, so this is an induced model, and then you get your ID. Imagine, on the other hand, if you showed up at Google and they already had your picture on file. In fact, they had your great-grandchildren's pictures on file and your grandfather's pictures on file. They had pictures on file for everybody who is around in the world today or who will ever be around in the universe. And that was the model Ehrlich was proposing, that we already have all the antibodies within us before an antigen shows up. And this seemed inconceivable. So most thinkers in the field moved away from Ehrlich. And the first people to actually formulate this were Horowitz and Brinell, who came up with a model for a direct template. Linus Pauling, the great chemist, took this further and essentially suggested that antibodies came from one of these pink primordial proteins within the cell. An antigen enters the cell. The antigen then reacts with the antibody, and the, the antibody, the preformed antibody, folds around the antigen, forms a new shape, and then is secreted. And this was the model that existed till 1957, because people couldn't accept that you could already have pre-existing repertoires which went into 10 to the 12 different possibilities, and you have these many different antibodies within you. In the 1950s, uh, Yerny would first suggest that maybe there's a model where we already have all the antibodies secreted from us and provided some data for that. And then David Talmadge would come up with another model, which is now called the clonal selection hypothesis. And this was further refined by, Mc by McFarland Burnett. And the model essentially states that we already have a range of immune cells, each with a different receptor. Okay? An antigen comes by, identifies one of those cells. The cell gets triggered. So this is now a clone of lymphocytes. The clone expands, so we have clonal expansion. And then after clonal expansion, we have these cells secrete antibodies, which are then going to be the effector molecules of the immune system. So this was a model, which is now the accepted model of the immune system, we, we already have pre-existing immune cells, each with a different receptor, and then antigen comes and triggers one of them. And this holds true both for T cells and for B cells. When the clonal selection hypothesis was put forward, we didn't know what the immune cells for adaptive immunity were. At this time, in 1957, we thought these were just macrophages, or some macrophage-like cell. We would soon learn that there were different cells that mediated these functions for the immune system. Okay. So by the 1960s, so antibodies were discovered in 1890, but by the 1960s, we have the first ideas of the structure of antibodies. And this is from the work of Jerry Edelman and Rodney Porter. So Edelman would show that antibodies are made up of two chains. So we have these two pink chains are the heavy chains, and the two orange chains are the light chains. And uh, these were associated and linked to each other 
by disulfide bridges. Porter would actually show that the antibody had different domains. And this is so shown in the next slide. So this is a much more modern slide. And you can, you'll note that in the antibody, there are heavy chains and light chains, but they can be cleaved by certain proteases to give you fragments called FAB fragments. So FAB fragments are basically the part of the antibody that binds antigen. And FC fragments, which are really the tail of the antibody. Crystal structures would then tell us the structure of an antibody domain. And this would all come in the 70s. So if you looked at an antibody domain, so here we have a schematic view of a domain in which you can notice that there is basically a ribbon. So it's a beta sheet which is folded over to form a beta barrel. And sticking out on top are some loops labeled here as CDR1, CDR2, and CDR3. So basically, you have a ribbon. The ribbon is joined together in a fold. And then each strand of the ribbon is linked to the next by a loop. And when you looked at the sequence of antibodies, so if you look on this part of the slide, you'll notice that there are three regions. If you compared 100 antibodies, there are three regions of the antibody sequence where the sequence varies a lot. And these are called CDR1, 2, and 3. And these correspond to those three loops that stick out from the top of the Ig domain. So immunoglobulin domains can be variable domains like this with the CDRs, or they can be constant domains which make up the rest of the antibody molecule. Okay? So if you think about it differently, the CDRs are like fingers. Okay? You have three fingers for the variable domain of the light chain, three fingers for the variable domain of the heavy chain. And the fingers can come close together to bind a small molecule, or they can splay out widely to form a surface that can accommodate a protein. So on the right, you can see there is actually over here an antigen bound to an antibody. It's a large protein antigen. So you can assume that CDR1, 2, and 3, the fingers, have splayed out to form a big surface to accommodate the antigen. This is another view of the FAB part of an antibody shown here in yellow and blue. And all the red residues that you see on the FAB correspond to those six fingers, CDR1, 2, and 3 from the heavy chain, and CDR1, 2, and 3 from the light chain. On the other side is Henneg lysozyme in green. And there, too, the red residues are the residues on Henneg lysozyme that interact with the red residues on the antibody, on the FAB of the antibody. The glutamine that's shown in purple is actually going to burrow deep into the groove in the middle of the red residues in the antibody. Antibodies have many functions, and most of, most of you are aware of them. They can neutralize viruses and toxins. So neutralization means that the antibody binds to the virus or to the toxin and prevents it from entering our cells or binding to a receptor. Antibodies can med mediate opsonization. So opsonization really means that a pathogen might be coated with an antibody, and then a receptor on the phagocyte, which is for the FC part of the antibody, it's for the tail of the antibody, recognizes the antibody and ingests the pathogen. We call that opsonization. There's another phenomenon called ADCC. Now, in ADCC, you have a virally infected cell. An NK cell recognizes an antibody that's coating the virally infected cell. And that triggers a receptor on the NK cell, which then causes the killing of the virally infected cell. And so that's another function of antibodies, where the antibody coats the target cell, and then an NK cell kills it. And then finally, one of the other functions of antibodies is mediated through complement. So the complement proteins can lyse a microbe. So this is over here. Or fragments of complement can serve as opsonins and help internalize pathogens. And you can also have complement fragments which drive inflammation. To summarize this part of the talk, antibodies protect you, but antibodies kill. Autoantibodies can make you very ill. Antibodies coat pathogens. They coat the infected cell. With NK cells and phagocytes, they give those microbes hell. When antibodies fix complement, 
the shit really hits the fan. You'll be blown to bits, little microbe. Run away if you can. You take a set of beta strands, you get a beta pleated sheet. Fold the pleated sheet in two, then the barrel is complete. Clip it with a disulfide bond, and you have an Ig fold, found even in archaebacteria. This domain is old. Loops make connections between the beta strands. If you want to make an FAB, please use both your hands. The loops are like fingers. They stick out at the top. Complementarity determining regions, the cream of the crop. Three fingers from the heavy, three fingers from the light, come together to create an antigen binding site. Bring the fingers close together, you get a cleft with a purpose. Splay the fingers widely, you get a protein binding surface. Antibodies protect you, but baby, antibodies kill. Autoantibodies can make you very ill. Or you Y-shaped globular proteins with the name that Ehrlich gave. If the good doctor could hear this doggerel, he'd be turning in his grave. The next question I'm going to turn to was long known as the God question, and God refers to the generation of diversity. It was impossible until the late 1960s to imagine how this question would ever be answered. The question essentially was this. We know we have now about 20,000 genes, but we can make maybe 10 to the 14 different antibodies. If you believe that one gene gives rise to one polypeptide, how is this ever going to be conceived of being possible? How can you use a limited number of genes to give you proteins that can recognize 10 to the 14 different things? So this question boggled everybody's imagination. It became one of the central questions of biology because no one could understand how this could actually happen. And this question remained so mysterious that it was assumed I think this was assumed by the early 1970s that it would be one of those things that would never be solved. We would never know the answer. So it was a religious question. Okay. Now, we did have some idea about antibody structure. I told you that Porter and Edelman had come out with the structure of two heavy chains and two light chains, and the existence of light chains was understood. There were plasma cytomas, so Henry Kunkel's lab at Rockefeller had described a lot of plasma cytomas. These are tumors that make a single antibody. So there, were, there was the ability to have a pure antibody, a pure light chain to try to sequence it. But by the early 60s, people still couldn't sequence an entire light chain protein. I mean, insulin had been sequenced, but this was a difficult task. And many groups were trying to sequence light chains. Now, Edelman, his mentor was Henry Kunkel, and Kunkel and Edelman didn't quite get along. And there was a great meeting that was going to be held in California in Warner Springs. I mean, I, to me, it's like Woodstock when I think about Warner Springs. And everybody who was anything in biology, from Seema Benzer to Chris Anfinson, everybody was invited to come and discuss and describe to others what they could think about how we created diversity in the immune system. So Mel Cohn was the organizer of this meeting, and he got a call from Rodney Potter, who was in Oxford. And Rodney Potter made this call saying, there's this postdoc at Rockefeller. You don't know who he is, but I've heard about his existence from Henry Kunkel. And this postdoc actually was with a, worked with a friend of Kunkel's called Lyman Craig. And he said, you should call him. His name is Norbert Hilchman, and he'll have something interesting to tell you. Call him to your meeting in Warner Springs. So at Warner Springs, uh, many people went and presented their knowledge, what they knew about antibody light chains. They had peptide maps. They couldn't quite figure out what the maps told them. They didn't have the sequence of a light chain. The heavy chains were too difficult. They were too big. And then there was this talk from Norbert Hirschman, this unknown person, never seen before, never heard of before. He shows up, and he gives his talk. And on his first slide, in these days, those days they had real slides, 
he showed the complete sequence of two antibody light chains. Okay? So we have two antibody light chains. And the remarkable thing about the sequence was that the light chains were identical in sequence for most of the molecules. But the top third, the top, the N-terminal parts were different. This was a remarkable finding. Everyone was excited. For the first time, there was some sense about how antibodies differed from each other. Okay? Uh, people stopped Hilchman. They asked him to go back to his earlier slides. But Hilchman did not. He moved rapidly through the rest of the slides. He was not collegial, and he left the meeting. And that's probably the reason why he was not the third recipient of the Nobel Prize along with Porter and Edelman, because he'd made a remarkable discovery. But Hilchman disappeared from public view. He was somewhat concerned that his data would be taken up, taken on by others and so on, but he didn't interact. But someone in the audience listened carefully to this talk. His name was Bill Dreher, who's a polymath. He's no longer around, but he was at Caltech uh, as a professor, an assistant professor at the time. And he looked at the data and said, I understand how diversity is created. Okay. So he went back to his lab. Most people didn't understand what he was trying to explain. But someone in his lab understood him. And they sat down and wrote a paper together. Okay. And that's called the Dreher and Bennett Hypothesis, published in 1965. And if I can give you an analogy to explain what the hypothesis says, Imagine that you have a, a lady with a strange wardrobe. She has just one black skirt, but maybe she has a thousand different tops. So by mixing and matching a thousand tops with one black skirt, she has a thousand outfits. Now imagine that she has 20 different, very different looking belts. Again, by mixing and matching these, she could get you 20,000 different outfits. And this is essentially what Dre and Bennett postulated, that genes might come in pieces, and then you have these cassettes, and you can join together different variable cassettes with one constant cassette and create different antibodies in different cells. Okay? You can prove this. It was impossible to prove this at the time. The recombinant DNA revolution hadn't occurred. Finally, when recombinant DNA couldn't be performed in California, or in, or in the city of Cambridge, Massachusetts, Susumu Tonegawa went off and worked at the Basel Institute of Immunology. And he did the crucial experiments to show that immunoglobulin genes come in pieces. This is just a southern blot showing that DNA is of a different size. Uh, so the DNA for the antibody genes is of a different size in all cells other than B cells. So in a liver cell, it's different from B cells. And he did a slightly different experiment, but I'm using the southern blot to, to show you this, to show you that DNA had been cut and joined and something had been done to it in a B cell. And this was Tony Gaba's big discovery. Okay. So when you look at immunoglobulin genes, we now know that these genes come in pieces. We have a whole range of V segments, and then we have D segments and J segments. So we have these different segments for the heavy chain. For the light chains, also, we have V segments and J segments. And these can be joined together in different cells. So, and I'll illustrate this in the next few slides. So this is the big picture view. You have a bunch of V segments, D segments, and J segments, upstream of a constant region segment. And then these, we're going to join together one V, one D, and one J to create an antibody gene. And then at the junctions between the Vs and Ds and Ds and Js, we can add or remove bases and create some junctional diversity. And then when this DNA is transcribed, you're going to get a messenger RNA, which actually has this rearranged DNA encoding the variable part of the antibody. And this is what's going to give you your antibody gene. Okay? So again, this is another view of light chains, where we have only V segments and J segments. So now the Vs are going to be joined to the J. And seen below, you have V kappa 29 joined to J kappa 3. And that creates a VJ uh, exon. And that's going to be upstream of the constant exons and give you a kappa light -like chain, for instance. Okay. This is a view that Tonegawa looked carefully at the sequences of the antibody genes. And what he was trying to ask was, how do you know where to cut 
how does the cell know where it should cut a V segment and a J segment so they can be joined together? And what he showed was that adjoining the constant, adjoining the coding region, so if you look at the V in, in orange, you'll notice that there's a seven base pair sequence. It's called a heptama, C-A-C-A-G-T-G. Then that's followed by a spacer. In this case, it's about 12 base pairs. And then it's followed by a nonomer, which is nine base pairs. But the heptama is always constant. It's always C-A-C-A-G-T-G. And this is going to be joined to another uh, gene segment downstream. So that's the one you see in green down there. So the green segment has also next to it a C-A-C-A-G-T-G, which is also the heptama. A spacer, this time the spacer is 23 base pairs. And then you have a nine base pair region, which is AT rich. So this sequence of a heptama, a spacer, and a nonomer was called a recombination signal sequence. And the spacer corresponds to either 12 base pairs is one turn of the DNA helix, or 23 base pairs is two turns of the DNA helix. And the rule was you always joint an RSS containing a 12 base pair spacer to another coding segment which has an RSS which contains a 23 base pair spacer. Never 12 to 12, never 23 to 23. This assures that V joins to J and V does, or D joins to J and V doesn't join to J depending on, on the locus you're looking at. So going back to this, so the first stage of VDJ recombination, so now in David Baltimore's lab, uh, David Schatz and Margie Ottinger discovered RAG1 and RAG2. And they showed that these two proteins actually help the chromosome ribbon. So the first step of VDJ recombination, which requires RAG1 and RAG2, is it allows the chromosome to ribbon between the two segments that are going to be joined. So you form a big loop. And then you have synapses, just bringing these two guys close to each other, though they were far away on the chromosome to begin with. Once this happens, RAG1 then is going to make a nick. So RAG1 makes a nick, and the 3' hydroxyl then attacks the other strand and forms a hairpin. So that the coding sequence now ends in a hairpin, whereas the signal sequence with the CACAGTG is released as a clean double strand break. So the first step was synapsis, then there was cutting. So we have synapsis, then we have cutting. Sorry, I have to go back to this slide. So the second step is cleavage. The next step is opening up. You made hairpins, so you have a hairpin, and you need to open up the two hairpins, one from the coding region for the V, the other from the coding region for the J, and join them together. So that's called hairpin opening and end processing. And the final step is repair or ligation where you join these pieces together. Okay? So just to explain what happens in junctional diversity, you have two hairpins. An enzyme called Artemis cuts the hairpin maybe eccentrically. So now you have a flap created where you have DNA from the bottom strand going to the top strand after the flap is created. Polymerase fills in, so now you filled in the gap. So those added nucleotides are called p-nucleotides. So they were created in a templated manner. And then at the blunt ends, we have another enzyme called TDT, terminal deoxynucleotidyl transferase, which you can add additional bases. We call them N-nucleotides. So now, the two hairpins, instead of just joining them together, we actually have created more diversity at the junction. So even if you join the same V and the same J in two different cells, the junctions are going to be different. Okay? So I'm going to summarize this part of the lecture. C-A-C-A-G-T-G the generation of diversity. A one-turn J kissed a two-turn V. They were brought into proximity by that lovely couple, RAG1, RAG2. RAG1 says, I'm gonna cut you. A pair of genes the rags do pick. At each heptama, they make a nick. The three prime hydroxyl then must bend to make a hairpin at the coding end. Artemis cuts the pretty hairpin. TDD puts in regions in. It's time to shut the DNA door, bring in XRCC and ligase 4. C-A-C-A-G-T-G, the generation of diversity. Now you know your G-O-D. Next time, all of immunology.
So if you go back and think about B-cell development in the context of understanding VDJ recombination, we can understand that we have an early stage called a pro-B cell. So the pro-B stage, you start to rearrange the antibody genes, and you start with the heavy chain. By the large pre-B stage, you have completed the rearrangement of the antibody heavy chain gene. And you're going to form a structure called the pre-BCR. I'll come back to that. Then the cell is going to go on eventually to become an immature B cell with IgM on the surface. So it has heavy chain and light chains. This cell is going to emigrate from the bone marrow to the spleen and then become a general garden variety follicular B cell. So one important checkpoint during B cell development is called the pre-BCR checkpoint. So when you go through VDJ recombination, you reach this point where you become a large pre-B cell. The large pre-B cell is a cell that has correctly rearranged the antibody heavy chain gene. You know, when you add these bases to the junctions, you can go out of frame. So only roughly half the cells are going to do this right. So the cells that have done it right on one chromosome are going to make a heavy chain protein. They're going to make something called the pre-B receptor. And these cells are going to survive and expand and become a huge population of selected pre-B cells. Each one of them will then, go, will then go on to rearrange a different light chain so that you now have B cells which are heavy chain and light chain. And the pre-BCR checkpoint is very important in the context of B cell development and disease. Okay. So the pre-BCR, so when the heavy chain is made, it associates with something called surrogate light chains, which will be described in a subsequent lecture in some detail. And it associates to form a receptor. And this receptor signals constitutively. The moment it's made, it's not looking for a ligand. It's saying, you've done it right. You have the right reading frame. You deserve to live. So the signals cause the expansion and survival of the cell. It also mediates a phenomenon called allergic exclusion, which I'll describe later in a subsequent lecture. Okay. So finally, the last question I'm going to talk about very briefly is about self-non-self -self recognition. I'm going to give you a narrow view of this. So you create this diverse repertoire of B cells and T cells. Each sees a different antigen. But sometimes these are going to be self-reactive. In fact, about 75% of the time, they are self-reactive. So how do you get rid of the self-reactive guys? I'm blood group A. If I make a blood group A B cell, it has the potential to kill me. I need to do something about it. So one of the mechanisms that this happens during development is that at this immature B cell stage, you actually have this phenomenon of tolerance or central tolerance. And central tolerance in B cells is mainly mediated by a process called receptor editing. And what I'm showing you here is that imagine that this is the self-reactive B cell over there, which has this orange light chain. It sees a self antigen. Let's say that's a red blood cell with blood group A on it. It triggers the cell, and the cell then changes its light chain. It no longer expresses the orange light chain. It rearranges a new light chain. So now it has the yellow light chain. And this combination of the heavy chain and the yellow light chain may be no longer self-reactive. This process is called receptor editing. It's a politically correct approach to tolerance. You just don't bump off the self-reactive cell. You allow it to reform itself. Okay? So here you see in receptor editing, you notice that we have, let's say, V kappa 29 has rearranged to J kappa 3. But if, I, if this cell were to edit, it might use V kappa 25 to go and rearrange to J kappa 2, something down, or, sorry, J kappa 4, or J kappa 5, something downstream of J kappa 3. And this would delete the bad light chain and bring in a new light chain. This could also happen on the other kappa light chain chromosome, or it could happen on a lambda light chain chromosome. So if a cell is self-reactive, it has a few opportunities to reform itself, make a new light chain, and become no longer self-reactive. So this is one mechanism of central tolerance, which is in B cells, this is a major mechanism. It's called receptor editing. The other mechanism is deletion. So if you look at a big picture view of what happens during lymphocyte development for B and T cells, we have assembly of receptors through VDJ recombination. Then cells go through an immature stage when they're like teenagers, where they have to be tested. And the ones which are self-reactive are going to be eliminated or edited. And that's tolerance. And then the cells are allowed to mature and become naive cells, go to the lymph nodes, and be ready to do battle with pathogens. So in this lecture, 
we talked about the three central questions that have shaped immunology. We first discussed the phenomenon of having pre-existing or induced antibodies. How does a vertebrate actually make complementary shapes? And we described this phenomenon as being explained best by the clonal selection hypothesis, which is now an accepted fact in immunology. We then asked the question, if you have these different immune cells, each with a different receptor, how do you create this incredible diversity? And we answered by explaining that this had now been explained by VDJ recombination. Then finally, we asked, if you have this incredible diversity, which can see almost every shape known to man, and in fact, any shape that might be created in the next century as well, we have receptors to recognize them, how do you get rid of cells which are self-reactive? How do you mediate this phenomenon of self, non-self recognition? And we explained that in B cells, the major way this was done in central tolerance was through receptor editing. There is another mechanism called deletion, which occurs in B cells, but is much more important in T cells. What we didn't talk about, because we didn't cover this, was the phenomenon of peripheral tolerance, which happens after you've made your B and T cells. And T regulatory cells, or regulatory T cells, are described as the cells that mediate a lot of peripheral tolerance, which basically squelch self-reactive B and T cells in the periphery. In the following two lectures, I'm going to talk about some research results. I'll go back to the discovery a few decades ago of the pre-B receptor and of BTK signaling in the next lecture, which will explain some of the concepts of the early stages of B cell development. And then in the final lecture, I will talk about how we have used this kind of knowledge about VDG recombination, VDG recombination and signaling and other things to try to understand human disease.